That's the Buffalo. I'm your host, John Rettinger, and I finally have my voice back. Thank you guys for dealing with my Batman episode last week. I could barely speak. Filming that video was really the only thing I said for the entire day. I was trying to save my voice just so I could film that. Uh, but we had some fun with it. Thank you guys for humoring me. Up this week on Ask the Buffalo, we are going to talk about BlackBerry Messenger on other platforms, some Google I.O. musings. I'm just back from the show. Some Chromebook value, whether or not it's a good value or not. We're going to talk some driverless cars. This is Ask the Buffalo. Let's, let's get asking. First question comes from a man Garg who asks, do you think that BlackBerry did the right decision in taking BBM cross platform? I think if BlackBerry and Thorsten Hines, the new president, thought that the hardware business perhaps didn't have a future, uh, taking BlackBerry Messenger cross platform absolutely was a smart move. Uh, it adds value, it adds user base. BlackBerry Messenger is something that's called a network good. So what a network good means is it's only useful if people are using it, like an operating system. If you have a great operating system but nobody uses it, it's not useful. So certainly getting more people on it increases the value. It also increases the potential valuation. Uh, if perhaps BlackBerry is looking to sell off assets in the future. I don't think that that's necessarily the case, but certainly it might be an unintended side effect. Personally though, I'm excited about BlackBerry Messenger on iOS and on Android, although it doesn't make that much sense from the hardware side. I know a lot of people were saying, great, I now no longer have a reason to carry a BlackBerry. The only reason I did in the first place was just to use BBM, and I know there are a lot of you out there. It seemed like very odd timing though, with two new BB10 devices out, the Q10 and the Z10, or Z10 if you prefer, but I think it's gonna be very interesting to see, and I personally am excited. So let's talk a little bit about IOs. One comes from our friend Josh, who asks, hey, John, what impressed you from Google I.O. this year? Did anything catch you off guard or was everything expected? First of all, nothing was really expected. My ex expectations for Google I.O. weren't even close. Uh, I put a joke up on Twitter while I was there at the keynote that I should have just put my whole predictions as a whole bunch of APIs, because uh, that was really all we got. And I'm not saying APIs weren't awesome, because a lot of cool stuff I'll talk about. What didn't have the sexy factor that last year's Google I.O. had, you know, when people were skydiving onto the roof and people were you know, mountain biking into the uh, Moscone Center, the lack of that flack, there was a lot of cool stuff announced. First, and probably the most exciting, is the Samsung Galaxy S4 with stock Android. Now, $650 price point, not so awesome, but unlocked bootloader and freaking stock Android without having to worry about rooting. Uh, it's kind of handy. I know rooting's not the hardest thing in the world and putting a custom ROM on there is not really difficult, but for sort of the average user, it's going to be really nice. So I am super excited about that, and that might be just enough to pry the HTC One out of my hands. Uh, the new Google Maps was also very cool. We did a whole write-up on it. You can check it out on the site, but I think they did an incredible job with that. Being able to pay with Gmail, new sort of merging of maps and Google Earth was cool. Real-time clouds were awesome. Being able to see the globe at night, it was neat. But certainly they did take a lot of nice steps to remove redundancy in their platforms, it really drove things forward. One of the understated things that didn't get enough attention, I think, was Google trying to really reduce fragmentation. And the new developer tools, you can actually see a picture of what it's gonna look like on different screen sizes. So, you know, four inches, five inches, tablet size. You can make sure that your application is gonna work well on all screen sizes instead of just relying on upscaling. So I give them credit for that as well. Oasis Jan asks, at John for Lakers, is the Chromebook worth it? So we, we talked about Google I.O. just a few minutes ago, and they actually gave away the top of the line Chromebook, the Chromebook Pixel, which starts at $1,200, which is a very questionable value. So if you're thinking about Chromebooks, you're thinking about the Pixel starting at 1200 bucks, going up to 15 for 64 gigs and LTE, no. That's not worth it all. If at that price, you're looking at you know, Surface Pro, iPads, a ton of other uh, tablets and laptop options available for that. But the lower price Samsung option Chromebooks uh, are potentially very, very appealing. So getting a chance to use Chrome OS, it works very well. They make it look and feel a little more desktop OS-y. You can sort of have that dock in the bottom, but all it does is launch web apps for the most part, and it works well. You can access things offline. You can access Google Docs offline if you want to do some editing and writing and all the rest of sort of the Google suite of applications. But I don't see a use for it. I don't know how I would use it. Now, that being said, you're not me. So if you're the person that does most of their stuff inside a browser window, it might do you very well and for a very cheap price point, you know, it could be a decent option. There are lower price Chrome boxes too, and maybe on the used market, get something for even a hundred bucks, in which case it might work out well for you. Anyway, that helped answer your question. This one comes from Jakey Liss F1. At John Four Lakers, you think driverless cars are the future and will one day become more popular than non-driverless cars? Hashtag ask the B. So you guys know me, I have a crush on Tesla. I'm willing to admit it publicly. So Tesla CEO Elon Musk was talking about driverless cars. The rumors that he was meeting with Sergey Brin from Google, and Google's coincidentally a investor in Tesla. The speculation was Tesla's looking to get into driverless cars. But Elon Musk, I thought, said it very well. We don't want to do driverless cars. We want to do cars that can offer autopilot. That's a much better connotation than driverless cars. Sort of driverless makes us feel like robots are going to be controlling it, take us anywhere we want to go. Autopilot means, hey, I'm tired this morning. Put the car in autopilot, let it take me to work. But when I'm ready, I'll get behind the wheel again. And I don't think it's ever going to be full automation where really you have no option of controlling the car at all. I think you'll always have the, you know, the capacity to drive like a normal car if you want. I would say that we're going to see them hit the mainstream sometime in the next three to four 
four years. They already have certain precursors to it right now. You've got active lane assist and I think BMW, Mercedes, and other manufacturers offer that'll turn the car for you. Things like adaptive cruise control that'll keep the distance in front of you and the other car and speed up or slow down depending on what you need. Volvo's got cars that can detect pedestrians and stop for you. There's all kinds of autonomous technology already out there. It's a matter of putting it all together. Uh, and certainly Google needs to be the ones that are leading that charge. So whether you like it or not, driverless cars are coming and coming very soon. But call them autopilot because I think it just sounds better. So I'm going to take a minute for the questions to talk about some kind of fun learning new things. Do you know about lynda.com? If you don't, you should because you can learn it at lynda.com. It's an online learning company with more than 77,000 video tutorials that teach a ton of stuff. Software, creative, and business skills, and a ton more. A membership starts at just 25 bucks per month, provides unlimited 24-7 access to top quality video courses taught by expert instructors with real world experience. Cool thing is you can learn anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace from bite-sized tutorials to comprehensive courses and things like like web design, programming design, photography, business, audio and video, and 3D and animation. To give lynda.com a free shot, try it for seven days by visiting lynda.com slash technobuffalo. Again, lynda.com slash technobuffalo will get you a free seven day trial, so give it a shot. So thank you guys for watching another episode of Ask the Buffalo. I hope you enjoyed. As always, I am your host, John Rettinger. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up. We most definitely appreciate it. Uh, check us out at technobuffalo.com for the latest and greatest tech news, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.